reef revolution. It's an idea that matters to the reef, to people and our planet. My name's Adam and I'm a thalassophile. What's that, you ask? It's a person that loves the ocean. For the past 50 years, as a scientist, manager and consultant, I've spent most of my time underwater, looking at corals, counting fish, interacting with sharks. I've loved it. But I've seen the beautiful and the sad. I think we all know the beautiful, clear water, reams of colourful, diverse fish, coral reefs that go as far as the eye can see. But I've also seen the sad. I've been immersed in brown sewage outfalls. I've seen fish kills covering beaches. I've seen oil spills, ship groundings. I've been shocked and saddened by the changes to the environment in my lifetime. 50%. What does 50% mean to you? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? 50% of our coral reefs have been lost in the last 30 years. That's a scientific fact. Is lost the right word? Maybe it's more correct to say we've damaged or destroyed 50% of our coral reefs over the last 30 years. And in Australia, we're relatively fortunate. If you go to other countries like the Maldives or Fiji or Tonga, they've lost or damaged up to 80 or 90% of their or our global coral reef resources. It is a very grave situation. Reefs are one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. On our doorstep, we've got one of the largest living ecosystems that can be seen from space. It supports thousands of species. Millions of us visit it each year. It generates a multi-billion dollar tourism and fishing industry. But as I said, it's very sad that those resources are declining. Why? Well, the main four reasons are given as climate change, coastal development, overfishing and declining water quality. I've got a slightly different perspective. I believe all those causes are real and we're doing some good work on them, but the biggest factor is people. People are linked to all of those factors and do damage to our reefs and to our environment and our planet. But let's flip that problem around. People are also fantastic. They're diverse, they're hopeful, they're creative. They do amazing things. They have fixed problems in the past. They've started revolutions. So I have a lot of hope for our future with people in Australia and throughout the world. Perhaps we can learn about caring for our reef from the people who have lived in our country sustainably for 40 to 60,000 years. The caring for country model shows the interlink and connection between people, knowledge and country. And it's sustainable. But we don't have a similar caring for reef model. In order to try and provoke your thinking, I've developed what I think is the relationship between people and fish and the reef. And in my perspective, it's a taking model where people take fish and they damage the reef. It's not interlinked. It's not as good as the caring for country model. I'd like to also move from the reef to the bigger picture of the planet 
and the sustainability because what we do locally also has an impact globally. I think we're all aware of the, the metaphor of footprints. We all have a footprint and that often reflects our environmental impact, whether it be the food we eat, the travel we do, um, the house we live in. Do you know your personal footprint? I know mine and I am sharing with you that the Australian population's footprint is equivalent to four planets. We only have one planet, so that's certainly not sustainable in the longer term. What do you love? We love our partners, we love our family, we love our children, we love our pets. We love our homes. Do we love the reef? I'd just like you to reflect on that and think about it. And if so, what does it mean? Eighty-five percent is a lot of Australians. Eighty-five percent of us would choose the reef compared to damaging coastal development such as coal mining. So that's, that's good news, and it's probably not surprising to most people in this room. So based on that, can we have a new model to how we relate to the reef? A model that's interconnected, that has a very strong foundation, where we care for the base, we don't want it to decline and shrink and be damaged. We want it to grow and be a solid foundation that we can then have sustainable fisheries and sustainable people and healthy communities. This is idealistic, but I have hope. But in order to have hope, you need change. Perhaps you need a revolution. I like this formula for change. It comes from an organisation called RARE, and the elements of their change model include knowledge, attitude, communication, barrier removal, threat reduction, and if all of those things come together, then you can achieve an outcome, and their organisation RARE is often targeting a conservation outcome. But I'd like to personalise it. My story, it's all about people. As a scientist, I can respect the formula side, but if you don't have people on board, it's only words, it's only numbers. So I'm going to personalise the model with some people that have influenced me. And my knowledge hero is Jacques Cousteau, a Frenchman who developed scuba diving. He put together the early films. He wrote a book, The Silent World. As a youngster growing up by the beach, it was Jacques Cousteau who I wanted to be. And I think he influenced my career to become a marine biologist. So thanks, Jacques. And this man is an absolute giant in terms of communication. Everyone would recognise his name. David Attenborough, his TV shows, his videos, his way of communication is amazing. And certainly over the last year or so, He's had a lot to say about the reef. In fact, he's even taken his message to prime ministers and presidents and said, you're not doing enough on climate change. You need to do more on that, otherwise we're going to lose the reef. Let's move to my next hero. I think you'll all recognise him as well. Ian Kiernan is an average Aussie bloke and a sailor. And he was concerned about rubbish, so he decided to get a few mates together and clean up Sydney Harbour. 40,000 people turned up, and it was an amazing result, and it's since gone to clean up Australia and clean up the world. So I've got a res lot of respect for people like Ian who can do amazing things. And finally, I don't think anyone's going to recognise this person. Barrier removal. She took a small group of concerned citizens about 40 years ago and tackled government, scientists, 
industry to try and stop mining the reef for coral and drilling the reef for oil. Her name's Judith Wright. She wrote a book called The Coral Battleground. So how am I going to bring these amazing people together and the formula for change and make it relevant and local and doable? And this is what this little project is all about. On our doorstep, we're very proud to have started something this year. We've partnered government, industry, scientists and the community and we've called it Great Barrier Reef Recovery at Magnetic Island. What's it about? Well, the whole idea is to involve people in the water doing something positive. And on Magnetic Island, there's a bit of an imbalance. There's too much seaweed and not enough coral. So what we're trying to do is do a science project where we intervene and people can remove some of that seaweed and over time, hopefully, coral will come back and settle and grow. It's early days, but we are having some good outcomes. I'll say again, it's all about people. And one of our indicators is how many people we've involved, how many days. And over a short period of time, we've actually exceeded our expectations. We've had over 155 people over 10 days in the water at Magnetic Island, which has been great. Most of them have been international students from America. And it's been quite interesting. Americans have the largest footprint in the world. And when we have a discussion, their behaviour changes. It makes it real for them. Numbers are important, but it's also about fun, engagement, making a difference, changing behaviours. And again, I've been very pleased to see the life-changing experiences of some of the people we've involved in this local program. For some people, it is all about environmental and it is extremely important, and we've measured those as well. Over a few short months, we have influenced 104 square metres of aquatic habitat by removing seaweed. We've collected a total weight of almost 70 kilos of seaweed. Our research has shown that baseline, we had about 50% seaweed in the quadrats at the start, and following intervention, we got it down to less than 10%. So that was positive. From a sustainability perspective, people often ask, what did you do with the seaweed? Well, we've thought about that as well, and the seaweed has been given to the local Reef Guardian School to be used as compost. So we're constantly evolving the project and trying to make a difference. And this is how you really make a difference. 155 people is great, but it's not enough for a revolution. But we're fortunate through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, web pages, video, that we've all got huge networks. We've been on national TV with this program. So we have now influenced tens of thousands and possibly millions of people about the benefits of people power and reef recovery. I'm very proud to show you this example. This was written by the students following one of their reef recovery field trips. They say things like, we were deeply moved by it all. It was a life-changing experience. We're going to tell others the reef's really important. So just to try and recap the reef recovery project, it started really small, but from small things, big things can grow. And this is a pilot study, but we've already had some social benefits in behavioural changes, threat reduction to the environment, and we're finding some conservation outcomes for the reefs at Magnetic Island. And here's the big picture. Change and people. Um, it's all together. And they're linked. And I wanted to emphasise, I have talked about the four heroes, the Jacques, the Ian Keenan, the bro, <laughs> and Judith Wright. But I also recognise the 155 people who were involved in the project. They're also heroes. Some of them had never snorkeled before, but they got in the water, they were hands-on, 
and they told their friends. So I'm very proud to recognise them as reef champions. But a revolution needs to be simple. And here's a brief revolution in four simple steps. Something you can remember. It's got an acronym. We love acronyms. CARE. Firstly, K is for knowledge. I'd love you all to do your personal footprint. Do it soon. Today, tomorrow, within a week. But don't forget and have a look at it and see where you are using up most of the planet's resources and see if you can reduce them. A is for attitude. Care about the reef, care about our country. Money is nice, we need that as well, but you've got to show that you care about the reef. I recognise we're a diverse audience. R for me is reef, but it could be recovery, or it could be revolution, or it could be renewable energy. I'll leave that to you. But I'm asking for you to find a project that you're passionate about and join it or start one up. And finally, whatever you do, you need to communicate it and you need to educate people. That's where the real power is. That's where a small group can turn into a large group. So in conclusion, a lot of people are silent and I think it's a real danger to not stand up and talk about things that matter to you. The reef matters to me, so I've been proud to share an embryonic idea on reef revolution and care. Now it's up to you. This is your call for action to do something positive for yourselves, for the reef, for the planet. Long live the reef. Viva the reef revolution.